Hi, this is Graphically Alex coming at you with all things fat related. If that's something that interests you, please subscribe. I'd love to have you. So for today, what I want to do is we're actually going to do the calorie episode on the maintenance phase. This, I think, will be really interesting to cover. I myself, I am currently counting calories, so I'm very interested to see what they have to say about it. <laughs> And I'm sure it's going to be just the absolute most objective, best takes ever. Um, I'm sure that they're totally going to be reasonable and it'll be fine. (laughs) So um, we'll see. We'll see what I have to say. Like I said, I'm currently on a calorie counting Thing. You know, I count calories, I'm in a deficit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as you guys know, I've always been a calorie realist, and many of the things that I do talk about on this channel are actually in regards to appetite management, hormone health, etc., to help you be able to stay on a calorie deficit so that you can lose. Because the science is clear if you reduce your calories, you will lose weight. But it's also equally clear that if you cannot maintain that deficit, then it doesn't really matter. You're not going to lose weight. So that's what I talk about a lot on this channel, especially from a super morbidly obese perspective that I think a lot of people have never experienced and are just uneducated about or they just don't know. And that's why I'm here. So let's go ahead and continue this process and let's start this podcast Now, I do have a migraine today, so if I'm a little meaner than usual, that's why. Also, can you just congratulate my non-moon face today? Fluid fluctuation, we love, we love. Um, Let's go ahead and get started. Remember, this music is what plays in my nightmares. Wait, I need, I need one. You need one. I had one, but then I'm like, my, my tagline was kind of a spoiler. So I'm going to say something else. Wait, what is it a spoiler of? Okay. I was going to say, welcome to maintenance phase, the podcast that raises a cubic centimeter of water by one degree oh buddy that's like the first five minutes <laughs> uh, welcome to maintenance phase the podcast that recommends 2000 of it per day no that wait, so bad. that was the worst <laughs> wait uh no i love it Lee. gosh it's so weird how their humor is look humor subjective i've said this every time i've covered this podcast but it kills me. It really does every time. I I recently read an article from your fat friend, which is Aubrey, who is the woman in this podcast. And she is only friends with people who basically bow down to her feet as a fat person and tell her that everything she says is correct. Now, I believe his name is Michael. He definitely acts like this, which by the way, I do have a video about that, which I will link here or show you where I did read that article. I did not know that they were the same. I did not know your fat friend was Aubrey. So thank you guys for telling me. But after reading the article, it really showed me their dynamic. And I just feel like Michael is so desperate to please. It's really weird. It's kind of awkward. That's that's by far my worst one. We I'm have sorry. not done a me episode in a while, and it's really showing up I'm how rusty, rusty you are. <laughs> <laughs> I've never co-hosted this show before. Uh, I'm Aubrey Gordon. I am Michael Hobbs. <laughs> uh, and today, as you may have gathered, I don't know how you would have gathered this. We're talking about calories. We're doing calories. Before we get to that, if you would like to support the show, you can do that on Patreon or you can buy t-shirts, mugs, okay. tote bags, all manner of merch. I found that there was like a ton of stuff that I did not know about calories oh. and just like straight up how they work. So today 
we're going to talk about, we're going to do part one of our two-parter. I am calling this one The Trouble with Calories. Oh, okay. And next time, we're going to do a deep dive into the history of this kind of like food and menu labeling. We'll get a little teaser taster of it today. Okay. It really blew my mind. I think I and many others have thought of calories as being like a very straightforward measure with very clear science behind it. And as per usual, everything is muddier than we think it is. Did you? Okay. So we're going into what I refer to a lot on this channel. We're already going into the hypohase. Hypos and hypothyroid, I believe Aubrey has that. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is when your hypo is bad enough, you see things incredibly black and white. So according to Aubrey, if calories are not 100% what they say they are at all times, or if the science is not 100% proven fact across all levels, no way of ever being able to challenge it in any way, shape, or form, then it's all fake. It's all wrong. Calories don't mean anything. And ultimately, your the amount of food you eat is meaningless. And it, it, that's I, I hope that that's not where she goes, but I'm sensing it. My 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 senses are tingling that that's where she's headed. So if it's not, like I said, 100%, no shadow of a doubt across any board of anything, we cannot exist on any estimates whatsoever. And so an estimate is not valid and it doesn't matter. And so just eat whatever and everything is random. I hope that that's not what she says, but I have a feeling that that's where she's going to go. Or at least that's what the implication will be. You think that it was simple because men on the internet are always shouting calories in, calories out at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you bested me again. I know. Doesn't she know? <laughs> it is. I mean, so like you already did it, but Mike, can you tell me what a calorie is? Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to fuck up the specifics, but... Isn't it the amount of energy that it takes to raise a cubic something of water by one degree? It's like you burn, I don't know, a piece of paper underneath a little cube of water and the water gets slightly warmer and you're like, that's a calorie. Is that right? <laughs> you suspend water in a cubic shape. Okay. That wasn't the best example because we don't eat paper, Michael. But I remember in high school biology, so this is not anything, this is nothing top tier, we had to measure calories of different foods. And one of the things that I burned was a peanut and it had a lot of calories in it. So it did raise the water by quite a bit before it stopped burning. But yes, that is where calories come from. In the air, over an open flame. <laughs> over a Zippo lighter. Yeah, that's yes. right. That's right. Yeah, so that's it. And cubic something is exactly right. And of course, there can be some type of interference, like the temperature of the air in the room, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure in a very, very clinical lab setting, it's not going to be, you know, it'll be as exact as it can be. But of course, it's not 100% exact. Duh. Right, right. You're sort of like leaving a blank for that space because we talk about calories. There are sort of two versions that people talk about. Oh, the dumb kilo calorie thing or kilo yep. or whatever. Yeah. We're going to get email. Calories are essentially the amount of energy that a food is estimated to have. That's the baseline of what a calorie is for anybody who doesn't know if I don't say it so I'm gonna I know, say like, it sometimes because sometimes you look on labels especially if you're like in a foreign country you look on the label and it's like 16,000 calories and you're like I don't understand but then you're like oh they're using like the weird calories yeah the yes. little calories yeah yeah so in physics historically the small calorie is defined as the amount of energy that is needed to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree celsius Okay. Most of us, when we talk about a calorie, are talking about a kilocalorie. That's okay. the amount of energy that it takes to raise the temperature of one liter of water by one degree Celsius, right? And that's 
at sea level. Oh, right, of course. Because boiling points are different at different elevations, blah, blah, blah. I learned that from the back of the macaroni and cheese box. <laughs> um, but then it's it's one of those things where it's like, I know what a calorie is in, in the sort of the scientific description. Like, I can put all of the words into that order, but that doesn't actually answer the question because... The way that we interact with calories is like a Snickers has, I don't know, 250 calories. And so it's like, okay, well, are they putting a Snicker under the water cube and lighting the Snickers on fire and like seeing how hot the water gets? (laughs) To me, that scientific definition doesn't actually get at what a calorie is, really. I really appreciate that you're just here to pave the way for what comes next. That you're like, I I have a question about this. And I'm like, literally the next bullet point in my show notes. I'm like, but Aubrey, what does that mean? But how do you determine it? (laughs) But that's literally how their whole friendship is defined. Um, (laughs) So there are many different ways to measure calories, many different kinds of what are called calorimeters. The most widely known and widely used one is called a bomb calorimeter. It is a sealed container that is filled with pure oxygen. Okay. And it is suspended in a container of water. So like inside that sealed container filled with pure oxygen, you put your Snickers bar, say, to determine how many calories are in it. You ignite it using electrical fuses, in this case, in that pure oxygen chamber, and it gives off heat into this sort of bath. So I wonder if they more so do it based upon like individual ingredients instead, and then they just sort of calculate it for something like a Snickers, or if they literally burn a Snickers in there. That would be interesting to know, I guess, but... Functionally, it would be the same, I guess. Bath of water that it's suspended in, and you've got a thermometer in that bath of water. So I was right about them lighting a sneaker on yes. fire? I was joking. You nope, know, that's what they do. Okay. It is worth knowing that the history of like how calories first appeared in written texts and in scientific literature is actually like pretty disputed. I looked into a bunch of different historical sources on this. And basically the closest that folks get to agreement is that calorie was coined as a term to measure heat in scientific literature sometime between 1787 and 1824. Oh, wow. So lots of gaps. Big gaps, right? And some people are like, it came out of France. And some people are like, it came out of Germany. And some people are like, it came out of, you know what I mean? Like there's like, it's disputed where it first showed up, who came up with it, what they were referring to. Right. It's like Nutella or fascism. Where it's like, <laughs> we know it's from Europe. But it's not clear where. Great. Somewhere in that region. So in that sort of early era. Gosh, they're so weird. Uh, in the 1800s-ish when calories are sort of coming into more common use in science calories were established as part of the original metric system oh and it starts being used in commerce in the uk stay with me you guys i promise there's probably gonna be something crazy in here there better be otherwise you guys failed me no i'm just kidding (laughs) otherwise i'm accusing you but this is the phase where i'm like starting to fall asleep a little bit let's let's stay to it though that's what long form content is We research, we see what they're saying, we see the logic, deep, deep, deep. And the U.S. starting in the sort of mid-1800s. But we don't really start talking about food calories and kilocalories more broadly until the late 19th century. The first Mm. sort of use that I was able to find is that it was first published in a U.S. medical textbook in 1894. This is a constant theme on this show of how young a lot of nutrition science is. Yeah, it's it's really, really young and also really, really old because some of this stuff hasn't really been revisited. Oh, nice. So what I wanted to do today is just like dig into a few of those core assumptions that we were talking about Mm -hmm. earlier, right? And I wanted to start by digging in on calories in calories out which is almost like a dieting meme at this point yeah my god okay so i will say it is definitely overly simplistic to say calories in calories out there's a whole host of factors that go into it i talk about this a lot on my channel 
It really depends on where your body is. Are you healthy? Okay, then how many calories in? How many calories out, right? You have to determine that. It's a very individualized thing. It's not something that everybody can just harp on you. I do use a BMR calculator online for where I'm currently at, but mostly it is based on estimates. That's how this works. At the end of the day, the goal, in my opinion, as far as the caloric side of losing weight, which is valid, is to have the most shallow deficit you can while still losing weight over time, especially over two weeks to a month. Has your weight gone down in that time frame? If yes, then you do have enough of a deficit. That's how it works. But you try to keep it shallow. You don't go for the lowest amount of calories possible. That is not the way you do this. I would never suggest that. It is usually unsustainable, and it is especially unsustainable as a morbidly obese or super morbidly obese person because you already have a lot of hormonal factors that are fighting against you. Mike, tell me about your sort of thoughts and feelings about calories in, calories out. I'm sure you've heard it until you're blue in the face. You know I have a spiel about calories in, calories out. Tell me. I have like a thing that I have a thing that I say whenever I'm confronted with this because as you also know, probably much better than I do, the minute you start talking about like fat phobia in society or and anything involving this issue at all, you will hear the phrase calories in, calories out within like 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then when you push back and you're like, uh, that, that seems a little bit simplistic. What you'll often hear is like, well, it's true. Are you saying it's not yeah. true? Oh, we've got a science denier over here. Yeah. And my retort to this is always that like human beings do not judge statements only on their truth value. Mm. Right. So if you say to me, Mike, my mom was diagnosed with cancer today. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Did you know the Titanic sank in 1912? Yeah. You're like, uh, that's, that's a little insensitive, Mike. I'm like, actually, oh, it's true. You're, you're saying it didn't sink in 1912? When did it sink, Aubrey? We got a science. Okay, so they're trying here. We're starting already with a complete denial between calories and weight. So let's break it down here. We're already getting there. Even within the context of my channel, I talk a lot about especially hypothyroidism, super morbid obesity, and morbid obesity. That is my experience. That is what I'm trying to educate, especially non-fat people on, so especially thin people on, or people who have never been fat, or who don't get it, or have never been huge, huge, huge. I remember, I was 383 pounds in August of 2021. That was my peak. That's huge. That's not cutesy huge. That's, hey guys, I've lost about 44 pounds of fat and I'm still huge. Somebody on the street, they would look at me and probably assume I've never lost any weight because of how big I still am. That's crazy. So just saying, that's what I'm talking about most of the time on this channel. But even within hypothyroidism, you do not necessarily have to become fat by being hypothyroid. There are cases where people undereat and it creates hypothyroidism. It can even give you that hypohaze. You can even start to act crazy or think weird thoughts if you do not eat enough. If you do not get enough nutrition, if you do not get enough calories to build the thyroid hormone in your body, you can induce yourself into a state of hypothyroidism. I have friends that do this where they sort of chronically undereat and they're very irritable. They do the black and white thinking. They are taken advantage of by people in their lives. Like it's this whole host of issues that can happen on a mental level, but also physically, right? They always feel cold. They're, you know, cold hands and feet, blah, 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 right? It's all the stereotypical things. They're tired, that kind of stuff. They can't sleep at night, right? These are the kind of things. Now, what do you think is the difference between one of my best friends who's real thin but super hypo 
and me, who was extremely morbidly obese and also super hypo. Calories. She doesn't eat very much. She doesn't eat healthy. I remember many days where she would barely eat. She'd have a coffee. She'd have a handful of gummy bears and one cheeseburger at McDonald's. And that was her whole day. Not very many calories. Eats way like a bird. Very, very, very low. Now she is shorter, you know, she's very thin, but still, that's really low calories. And it, it, I'm just saying, she's not fat. Me, on the other hand, at my height of my BED, when I had a massive relapse, I was eating 7,500 calories a day for three or four months. I gained 40 pounds in three months. Maybe it was 30 pounds. I'm sorry. It was 30 pounds. I gained 30 pounds in three months, I believe. Crazy. Calories are the difference. So even within hormonal factors, calories make a difference. If you're super hypo and you eat a typical diet where you're having a normal amount of calories, you're probably just going to be chubby, semi-fat. But there's a lot of people that don't eat very much at all and they are thin. You cannot be fat without eating a lot of calories. So anytime they try to say this, anytime they try to push this, anytime they try to do anything, most of the time these hormonal factors, they tend to make you eat more, but you're still eating more. That's why you're fat, but it doesn't do that to everybody. There are other people where they just do not eat. Maybe the the state of hypo in them, it makes them nauseous or something. They don't want to eat and they don't. That could be a genetic factor. But at the end of the day, they're still not eating. When someone like Taylor Swift when she exhibits the black and white thinking of hypo, when she she's madly in love with this man, but then he burns her and then she hates his guts. So like everything that she loved about him is now over and he's just another picture to burn. It's because she had that ED, she was under eating. And so she had that same factor, but guess what? She wasn't fat. That's what they don't acknowledge. So yes, calories in, calories out is real. However, it is more complicated than that. Your horm- your hormones do play a factor, absolutely. It's denier on our hands here. To, to yeah. me, the phrase calories in, calories out has always had the same amount of usefulness as mm-hmm. saying like, well, to win a basketball game, you have to score more points. Yeah. <laughs> and then the coach is like, well... One of my kids like broke his ankle and like the bus isn't here to take us to the arena where we have to play. And it's like, ah, 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 to win a basketball game, you just have have to to score score more more points. points. Yeah. Right. Yes. But you in that, within that framework, you would say points don't matter. It's, it's all a construct. It's not real. Points are an ethereal concept that have no basis on if you win or not. That's what you're saying. So they're trying to frame the other people as extreme when they are just as extreme, because that is literally what he just did. This is one of the things that irritates me so badly about FA logic is they literally will say something and then discount what they just said within a sentence. It's crazy. And I have a migraine and I'm very nauseous right now. So this is not helping. (laughs) It's like, it's true that that's how you win a basketball game, but that doesn't tell you how to win a basketball game. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm not coming to you with a question like, how do I win a basketball game? It's like, I'm coming to you with a very specific concern and you are then going back to the highest imaginable level of abstraction and telling me the most, the number one first fact about a basketball game that obviously if I'm a basketball coach, I already know. And so when people say calories in, calories out, it's like, it's not useful. Yeah. And so whether or not it's true is completely irrelevant 
It's not an appropriate thing to say in like 99. It's not completely irrelevant. That's too, that's an exaggeration. It could be unhelpful though. That I will agree with, but it is not completely unrelated. 0.9% of situations in which it is said. That's my spiel. I feel you. It's a thing that people say overwhelmingly in bad faith. Yes. Right? Good God. Overwhelmingly, it's not coming from people who are seeking to understand because if they were seeking to understand, it would be a question instead of like a weird challenge right. or a statement or whatever. Right? right? Uh, well, they don't, they don't understand why people can't maintain a deficit. That's what they don't understand. And that part is valid. And that's a, that is a question that doctors should be asking. That is a question that scientists should be asking. That is a question that the public should be asking. And they often don't. Because in their mind, well, I can just do it. Why can't you? When you are super morbidly obese, you are not in a similar body state to somebody who is in an average BMI state. It's just not even comparable. And you may have to take my word on that. Trust me, if you just gain two or 300 pounds, you will absolutely understand what I'm saying. If you really want to know, if you really want to know, <laughs> then you'll know. But I'm guessing you don't want to actually do that. So you may have to actually listen to fat people occasionally, which a lot of people don't want to. There are people that do, though, so I have to give credit where it's due. But I'm just saying. <laughs> I have had my own responses to that. They've all been super ineffective, not yeah. because there's a perfect thing to say in those yeah. moments. No, but because when someone tells you, like, it's just calories in, calories out, they're telling you they're not gettable. And they yeah, don't yeah, want yeah, to yeah. understand. Yeah. We're going to talk about the science of this stuff because I find it really interesting. Okay, that's weird. That's not 100% true. Again, that's a black and white thinking statement from, oh my gosh, I, I don't know why I want to call her Aubrey or Audrey. I always forget. I'm so sorry. Thing, And it's been really illuminating and fascinating and has given me a whole lot more to work with. But this episode is not going to give you rejoinders to people who say that. This isn't the clapback episode. <laughs> this is not the clapback episode, Only nor clap is it the persuasion episode, right? Right. My ineffective response to the calories in, calories out stuff, I've, I've run through a few of them, but the one of the earliest ones was people would be like, it's calories in, calories out. And often they'll say, it's the first law of thermodynamics. Oh, I love, yes. Oh, I love that one. The physics. Yeah. Whenever they bring right. up physics. The law of so I do that as well. So I feel a little called out. But yes, thermodynamics, energy in, the fat is coming from something. I do think they don't understand. Now, this is something that the maintenance phase does. They do not acknowledge the crazy FAs. They do not acknowledge fat acceptance TikTok. They don't acknowledge the people that say these types of things all the time. And that's where they live in an alternate reality where people don't say these things. We have seen them talk about this on previous episodes of me covering this podcast. So they don't believe that anybody in the FA community doesn't take into account thermodynamics. There are a lot of fat acceptance people that act as if you can get fat through osmosis in the air or through the sun and that is just not possible. I've already told you guys, you can have messed up hormones, whether you're thin or fat. You can even have hypo, whether you're thin or fat. But at the end of the day, you cannot be fat without calories. It is not possible. You are eating an excess of calories. There is no way around that. And if you deny that, then people say stuff like this to you. Love conservation it. the idea that energy can't be created or destroyed in a closed system yeah. right thanks bill nye really smart thank you for that cool. i appreciate your comments good bow tie uh -huh. <laughs> the response that i came up with early on to this stuff which i don't recommend was i would be like oh yeah well the first law of thermodynamics only applies to closed systems <laughs> You tried to out Bill Nye them. That's good. I tried. It's like 
so ineffective. <laughs> the reason why that's ineffective, Aubrey, is because you're assuming that they know or give a shit about thermodynamics. <laughs> People who bring up thermodynamics right after calories in, calories out, don't know shit about thermodynamics, I guarantee. I'm sure you're right. Right, because if you do, you know what a closed system is, right? Which is like nothing gets in, nothing comes out, and our bodies are not closed systems. You're constantly eating food, breathing air, like you're in an environment. Yes. And there are quite a few research papers that I read in the lead up to this that were like, can we stop with thermodynamics in human bodies, (laughs) right? Like, Okay, so I will give her that. She's right. That is correct. One point for Gryffindor. <laughs> a bunch of researchers were like, this is not what it's about, everybody. I love I love thinking of you doing like only if it's a closed system and then like lifting up a microphone and dropping it on the ground. Be like, yeah, <laughs> gotcha. Zing. Uh, <laughs> so I decided to look into like, where did we get this idea of calories in, calories out? Where does it first sort of appear? Yeah. What fucking message board did this first show up on? Jesus the message Christ. board of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in the year oh. of 1959. Wait, really? Uh-huh. So there is this paper that gets published in this nutrition journal by an MD named Max Wisnowski. Mm-hmm. Calories in, calories out is sometimes referred to as Wisnowski's rule. Mm-hmm. He laid out an analysis of existing literature on weight loss and calories and food and all that kind of stuff and concluded that each pound of fat lost or gained, each pound of fat tissue, contained 3,500 calories. Oh, that's the origin of this thing, too. Mm-hmm. Ah, this comes up a lot. We're going to get so many little, like, Rosetta Stone moments of, like, wait a minute, that thing it comes from this? This is the basis of, like, if you switch from, like, I don't know, a, a supersized meal to a non-supersized meal over the course of a year. That'll save you yeah. 17,000 calories, and then you'll lose six pounds in a year or whatever. Like, this 35... 35- Okay, so that stuff is actually really annoying because it's not true. At the end of the day, whatever reduction you do or surplus you do, you will reach a point where your weight matches that amount of energy. So if you go over by 100 calories a day, if you stay only at 100 calories, you will gain until your BMR goes up with your weight gain because you have to carry yourself around, it will eventually go up that 100 calorie level and you will no longer gain. Unless if you're having issues where you continually are eating 100 over. So even as you gain weight, you go over and you stay at that 100 calories over. That's the only way that that would work. Even within my deficit, I have had to reduce my calories. So right now, my calories daily are 2550. When I started calorie counting in 2022, it was 3000. So I've had to reduce quite a bit. Now I have slowed that reduction. Once I got to about 340, I slowed it from 100 calories down to 50 calories cutting because I want to stay at my BMR. Because what I want is for my activity to be burning my fat. I don't want to have my body not getting enough food for basic metabolic function. In my opinion and in my experience, it's better to burn the fat off through activity, even if it is just your daily activities. So anyways, let's continue. 500 number is always invoked in these conversations. Yeah. yeah. Switch from whole milk to skim milk. And right. before you know it, you will have dropped three pounds without even right. thinking about it or whatever. Yes. So Yeah, that's not how that works. Oh, he determines that each pound of human fat tissue, human adipose tissue, has the what he calls the caloric equivalent of 3,500 calories. Mm-hmm. And so from there, he concludes that cutting 3,500 calories from your diet would lead to the loss of one pound of fat tissue. Right. Years later, there's this very influential medical textbook. It's called Modern Nutrition in Health and Disease. And it takes up this Wisnowski's rule 
and writes that losing one pound would require an energy deficit of 3,500 calories, right? So that's where we start to get it seeping out into like medical usage world is like... Right. So always remember that would be a pound of fat. You may lose more than that. You could lose water as well. Water wouldn't take calorie a deficit to lose necessarily. And you could lose muscle as well. So... There's, like I said, there are hormonal factors. If you are really, really very, very hypo, like I've described, if your cortisol is through the roof, if you are massively stressed out, you will burn a lot more muscle than somebody who's not in that situation. If you are running 10 miles a day and really stressing out your system and increasing that cortisol and that adrenaline, you are burning a lot of muscle. So in a system where your body is functioning well, you're living on thyroid hormone and not adrenaline, you will lose drastically more fat than muscle or even just fat in lucky situations. So you have to keep that in mind. That it's not 100%. Just because you cut the calories doesn't mean you're losing that much of fat. Again, calories in, calories out in isolation is not useful. You must, you must keep your hormone health in mind. That is what I advocate for on this channel. I just want you all, I want you all to be aware. I was never aware. And I suffered. I failed over and over again losing weight. Because I was not aware and I did not even consider my hormone health. And it really bit me in the ass. That's why I talk about it. Because I know how disastrous it can be if you do not even think of this as a factor at all. And I know so many people that are just cutting calories and they don't even think about it. It's very important. Okay, we're training up future healthcare providers using right. this sort of rhetoric and it sounds really solid right and it makes a lot of sense on its face right and you can see how it becomes individual diet advice because then it can easily be well if you cut 500 calories a day then you'll lose a pound a week right and it seems like here's the answer right we figured it out everybody yeah. 1959 we did it yes and it's not that simple yeah you can totally see for all of those reasons you could see why this takes off right yeah and also this is an idea from the 1950s. Yeah. <laughs> we have had really substantial advancements in the last 60 plus years, and we're still kind of in a tough spot with figuring out a bunch of this stuff, right? Yeah. In those 60 years, though, a bunch of the assumptions that Max Wisnowski made in developing this calories in, calories out sort of approach have since been disproven. I, I, I know where you're going with this, so I'm remaining silent. Go, no, tell me where you think I'm going with it. My understanding of the current science is that the human body isn't just like a little calorie processing machine, that your metabolism slows down and speeds up according to all kinds of internal systems. Mm -hmm. So if hormones, hormone health, which we do have influence on, but it's not exactly this clear-cut machine view. So they are correct here, but they will say there is zero influence that you can have over that. That's not true. You can take care of yourself. If you l reduce the stress in your life, for example, that would have an effect on your hormones. That may not be easy. If you eat organic, that would lower your cortisol. That would be an effect on your hormones, but it may not be easy. So yes, there are barriers. There are certain things. I talk a lot about the seed oils on this channel. That is something you can do to make your, to if you avoid that, it makes it much easier to wrangle your hormones in and thus make calorie counting and being in a deficit attainable, especially for a long-term process. It's a process. 
if you eat 3,500 calories fewer, you don't just keep losing a pound a week until yeah. nothingness, until like the singularity. Yeah. Your body eventually is going to adjust and you're exactly. going to plateau. Totally, totally. And even like highly active people, if you sort of like applied this kind of formula of calories in, calories out to Michael Phelps, who eats like 7,000 calories a day, you'd be like, that guy's getting fat even with the levels of activity that he has. Right. But he's right. not, right? Like there are people that... Really your height and your your biological sex and also your age, they all definitely affect your BMR and your metabolic rate on a genetic level. So that part is true. However, with age, it doesn't reduce quite as much as people act like. A lot of times people gain weight as they get older because they just eat like a hog and they are very sedentary or they're living very stressful lives. So their hormones get worse and they stress eat. This type of stuff happens a lot, especially towards your forties. That's why a lot of people gain weight at that time, especially like for women, they have menopause, right? Menopause puts you in a more difficult hormonal state for weight loss or weight maintenance as your estrogen goes up much higher. And if it was already high, then it can cause problems. That's something that is completely age-based, you know, typically for a woman, but it does definitely have an effect. So you do have to look at this from a whole picture. You cannot just say calories in, calories out. It's not fair. The same is true for women post-childbirth and in late stages of pregnancy. A lot of things that have to do with reproductive health for women, they can affect how easy or difficult it is to lose weight at a given time it's it is definitely a factor (laughs) absolutely we all know who like eat very small amounts and are fat people or eat very large amounts and are thin people right like yeah he assumes that it's a weight loss is a totally linear process and that like it's almost like a ledger right like you make a deposit or you make a withdrawal and that's it but He's using a bomb calorimeter to determine all of this. And human beings are not containers of pure oxygen suspended in water. Right. When you take in less energy, your body also expends less energy. So over time, it does get harder and harder to lose weight. You lose less and less weight over time if you're restricting calories. It depends. It depends on the hormone health. And overall, energy is still energy. Energy expended is still energy expended. So it depends. Like I said, I do have to cut my calories. I cut it at this time. I cut it after every 10 pounds. That has worked thus far. Um, I don't know that my output is drastically less. I don't think so. It's just I weigh less. And so I don't have as much going on as far as like an overall maintenance of my body. It takes less But again, they tend to, within fat acceptance spaces, they act as if it's this mythical thing. Like if you count calories, your metabolism just goes down and then it can never come back. I see this a lot with the feminist land land whale. She acts like because she did toxic diets in the past, she can never lose weight. I mean, that's not true. Like, you can restore metabolism. It usually has to do with stress. I talk about it a lot. Thyroid health. Thyroid literally controls your metabolism. But again, it's almost never talked about within a weight loss conversation, which is insane to me anyway. And not only that, but when you lose weight... You're losing fat, yes, but you're also losing muscle mass. Right. Again, it depends. I myself, I have not lost muscle mass. I have lost 44 pounds of fat. I have gained a little less than 8 pounds of muscle in the past year. So when you are very, very big, you don't necessarily have to. It's not a have to. It really depends on your overall picture You know, biological sex could definitely be a factor, but remember, it's hard to 
make blanket statements about every person in every circumstance. I have not lost muscle thus far. So I am disproving what she said. That may not be the case all the way to the end of my weight loss, but for the first almost 45 pounds of pure fat I have lost, I have gained 7.6 or 8 muscle or something like that. 7, 7 point something pounds of muscle. But you have to go to the gym, you have to eat enough protein, you have to cover your bases, have enough of hormone health, and you have to do a lot and you have to take care of yourself. It's a process. It's, you're not a machine. You cannot eat 1,500 calories of Takis every day and expect to gain muscle. You won't. You may lose weight, but you will absolutely lose muscle if you eat that. Period. Let's continue. Which burns calories. Which burns calories, right. So, like, that also really complicates things, right? right? Wait, do you want to hear one of my calories in, calories out zingers? Ooh, yes, please. You're like, I know you said it wasn't the clapback episode, but. But, but, I have a clapback. I've never actually used this. The thing is, I always, because people are always saying, like, well, ooh, calories in, calories out is true. And I'm like, well, it's a, it's an accurate theory, but there's just two problems. The first problem is calories in, and the second problem is calories out. And <laughs> it turns out both of those things are actually significantly more complicated. Yes. So. By today's standards, the evidence that Max Wisnowski was using to create this Wisnowski's rule, this calories in, calories out thing, would be considered weak. It would be considered oh, weak okay. evidence by today's standards, right? Ooh, you're getting Cochrane on them. Since then... Researchers have found a ton of things that influence our ability to lose or gain weight mm. from hormonal influences to genetic markers to environmental changes, right? Like there are lots and lots of things and none of that is captured in this very right. simple. That is true. But again, what does FA act as if they act as if you have no, no influence particularly on hormones and environmental factors. You can live in a less toxic area. You can avoid certain cleaning chemicals. You can do things within your environment to reduce your exposure, just as you can take certain steps, like avoiding seed oils. You can make sure you're getting your animal protein, calcium, salt, saturated fat, and carbs to get that thyroid hormone going so that you are in a better place hormonally, have that balanced diet, and you can have less stress or try to reduce as much as you can, have healthy movement, not overtrain. Like it's a process. You have to take care of yourself. You're not a machine. You are a living being and your body requires care. And that's just a reality that a lot of people do not want to accept on both sides of this debate. Equation. Right. The exact thing that makes it so sort of like tempting to believe is the reason that it's like not very accurate or useful. Right? It's, it's simple. Like, it's just like a simple yeah. number. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned your body does sort of downshift. It gets harder, right, to lose mm -hmm. weight as time goes on. In 2011, this researcher named Kevin Hall does some research to directly challenge Wisnowski's rule. Mm. What he found was that if you only factor in that metabolic sort of downshift and burning fewer calories, Kevin Hall found that Wisnowski's rule overpredicted weight loss by 100%. Oh, wow. So basically people are cutting 3,500 calories from their diet and they're losing half a pound, not a pound. Over time, right? So like part of the way that this works is it's a declining graph, right? right. The longer you restrict your calories and the more you restrict your calories, the more your metabolism downshifts, the fewer calories you burn and the harder weight loss gets, right? Right. Because you've lost weight. So you do have to continue to reduce or you have to up your expenditure, Yes, but that's because you're smaller. That's because you have less fat on you. And so it takes less work to keep you alive. That's at its base. Again, if you're losing weight eating a bag of Takis every day and that's all you're eating, you will absolutely lose tons of muscle because there isn't any building blocks for those muscles. 
And so if you do not have a balanced diet, you can create massive problems. That's important to keep in account. So somebody doing that, they will have a much slower metabolism, much faster. He did this sort of like over the course of a year. He said that calories in, calories out would say you would lose twice as much weight as you actually would given the way that your metabolism downshifts, right? Right. And I'll also say like there is some research, most famously with the Biggest Loser study, Mm. that finds that calorie restriction in the long term actually damages your metabolism and that downshift is permanent. Right. Right. It's because of the hormone health effects on overtraining, overcutting calories. It's not exactly permanent, but you'd have to actually take steps to restore yourself, which most people don't do. Most people on the biggest loser, they go back to eating a bunch of seed oils. They go back to eating what they ate. And so their metabolism is worse because they didn't take certain steps to make it better. You have to like feed back into the system if you severely damage it. That's what I had to do. It took me a year and a half of restoring metabolic health and my thyroid health in particular before I could attempt a caloric deficit. It takes time when you damage yourself. In 2015, just four years later, there's a paper that is released in the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics And they tried to do this sort of omnibus, like, here's everything that's wrong with calories in, calories out. Mm -hmm. Its authors essentially concluded that the rule is easy to use, Wisniewski's rule and calories in, calories out is easy to use, but, quote, lacks a contemporary scientific foundation and leads to a large error in weight loss prediction, even over the short term. That's the mic drop. That's the actual one. That's... The mic drop. It doesn't (laughs) account for anything we've learned in the last like 64 years. Right. There are a few things that they point out. One, they point out that it doesn't account for the energy that's actually expended in digesting your food. We now think that between 10 and 15 percent of the calories of a given food are actually just used in the digestion of that food. Wow. So take like 10 percent off the top. But again, that's why you have a shallow deficit. It also doesn't account for a ton of stuff that we've learned about your endocrine system and hormones and how those Mm -hmm. influence body shape and size. It doesn't account for cortisol or ghrelin or insulin. All of those are hormones that are known to impact your digestion, your blood sugar, your hunger and satiety cues, right? Like, yeah. Are they going to mention thyroid or are they going to avoid it as well? All of that kind of stuff is completely left out of this. It also doesn't distinguish be- didn't mention it between what the difference is between calories from different sources. Mm. It's not distinguishing between calories from fat versus carbs versus protein, right. sure. Right. But also, I didn't think the jury was still out on calories from alcohol. What meaning like they don't count for like making you fat or something? What I'm going to send you a quote from a doctor. Okay. Uh, It says, there's a big debate on whether alcohol calories are even usable, whether you can even turn them into fat. It's not easy, says Ken Fujioka, MD, a weight loss. There are many, many hormonal factors involved with alcohol that do make weight gain easier. And people that drink a lot, not always, but it does tend to halt weight loss if you're trying to lose weight and get you to gain more weight. So it may be indirect, but it's still not beneficial. I do not drink. Expert at Scripps Health in San Diego. When you look at various studies, you actually get mixed results. Some studies say it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. Others say it's associated with weight gain. So it's It's because people are at different levels of health. People also drink different amounts. So it's very difficult to just have a blanket statement with something like that. It's kind of obtuse if somebody has fatty liver alcohol is going to affect them a lot more like a lot more differently i don't know why i can't speak right now probably because of my migraine than somebody who doesn't have fatty liver so it's like you have to study like they'd have to do studies breaking up every single group of people to get real answers and they don't most of the time people think about these things very simplistically People have this sort of like love and light. We are all one. 
mindset when it comes to bodies and health. And so it is ridiculous a lot of the time the way that they do these studies. That's just my opinion. <laughs> it's a real open mess. Wait, so And then you have the, the FAs, which are the complete opposite. Then it's like we're all alien creatures that have no connection to each other whatsoever. And you cannot make any generalizations about anybody ever. And it's like I'm very much in the middle I think there are certain generalizations that are true, like you must eat a lot of calories to be fat, but there can be differences like somebody who has fatty liver versus somebody who doesn't. They're going to metabolize food differently. I think gray area is very important when it comes to this. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> so it might be the case that just Thanks. like booze calories don't count ed mcmahon might be right I know, we don't I know. <laughs> I know i'm writing our inevitable diet book in my head right now <laughs> like actually <laughs> i include that not to be like everybody go get wasted but to, right. <laughs> to be like look that is a thing that i really thought was like a bedrock thing no it is a really open question right. about how your body processes calories from alcohol i mean this is kind of the calorie but it's not like people are just drinking alcohol from hand sanitizer, you know? It's like, no, like, there's calories with around the drink. Like, let's not get it twisted. There's carbs in beer, for example. Come on. Calories in problem. Yeah. Because two people might eat the same meal and, like, you know, both have a hamburger and a beer. And one person will, like, be able to use... 800 calories and the other person will be able to use like a thousand calories right totally so like that's actually another point that these authors of this paper bring up is they're like look 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 even if we came up with the best possible population level modeling of like what will generally contribute to weight loss or weight gain at the population level that's not going to translate into individual right. behaviors because it can't capture individual biological differences, right? right? You can restrict calories all day long for someone with lipedema. They're not going to lose weight in the same right. way that a person without lipedema would lose weight. Right. And there's just not really like a... That's true. ...handy dandy calorie calculator that incorporates all of those right. things and can just go all right, your personal calorie level is this. Like, no, we don't know how to do that. Right. And even if we did, again, calorie restriction doesn't produce weight loss in the long term. Right. right. It slows you way down over time. Right. The that's not true. So that's another strategy they use. They'll say some true things and then they'll just throw something in and they just assume that you agree. I don't agree. <sighs> It depends on how much muscle you have. It depends on a lot of different factors. If you're gaining muscle while you're losing fat, you will not necessarily have drastic calorie reduction. It's like it can be very little. Like I said, 50, 50 calories for 10 pounds less is not very much. It's like, come on. <sighs> They're way overshooting that. The thing that these sort of authors conclude with in this paper is genuinely that models like these, these kinds of universal models of like everybody. I'm sorry, I'm tired and this migraine is killing me. Needs to eat this many calories or restrict this many calories and that will lead to this kind of weight loss cannot be used to predict any individual's weight loss or gain. Right. That is how far they go. It's not just like there are some exceptions where this wouldn't apply. It's like this doesn't work for any individual. Right. Like, stop using it. Yeah. And I think that's also like born out. But you can find it out for yourself. You can count calories, see if you lose, gain, etc. That's what I did. And then you can find that balance over time. It's not a contest. You're not on the biggest loser. You don't have to do it all in a day. You can take it slow and lower your calories at the slowest rate possible. Not by our personal experiences, right? Like if anybody's tried to lose weight, you know that you plateau real hard. And like the right. longer you go, the harder it gets. That's not you losing your willpower. Not for true. It's been getting easier for me over time. It's still very, very hard, but it's like where I'm at right now. It's not as hard as it was in early April. It was brutally hard 
to go back to the deficit after the winter. It was so hard in March and early April. It was very difficult. It's getting easier over time. Or whatever else we have sort of learned to attribute that to. That is your body kicking in and like a bunch of bodily systems kicking in to downshift how much energy you burn and to conserve energy and to make sure that you have enough energy to continue to live and survive. And none of it's in your control at all. It's just like an automatic. Not true. So there's another one of those assumptions they just throw out there. Not at all true. I think your body does, basically. Yeah, totally. So when this 2015 paper comes out, the debate around calories in, calories out is just sort of continuing to go. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of different perspectives on calories and weight loss and what really works and what really doesn't in the research, but they pretty much all agree on one thing. This straightforward, like just restrict calories thing, calories in, calories out, just doesn't work. Mm. The most recent entry into this sort of set of like, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's actually this about sort of weight loss and calories is a 2022 paper from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that Mm. actually argued that the brain is the primary organ that governs weight loss, not consciously, but nearly all subconsciously. In the sense that, yes, the brain controls everything in the body. Absolutely. But we know your primary metabolism organ is your thyroid. Like, really? Do we have to just like, I mean, look at the amount of, like, look at how hard they are trying to avoid that. Isn't that crazy to you? Isn't that's, it's infuriating to me. It is crazy. Like what in the, what the? It's like, The elephant in the room. It's the big butterfly in the room. Hello? Mm. We're trying to like consciously act our way out of a thing that is happening in our bodies without our awareness. We're trying to be like, no, you just need to have enough willpower. Well, a lot of the research shows that like willpower around food is just like how much ghrelin is in your system. Right. In that same article, they say. It's about energy. How much energy are you producing? How much... How much of the calories that you're eating are going towards energy production or how much are going straight into fat cells? That's what matters. That's the number one thing that matters. If you have zero energy, you will feel hungrier, period. If you're energized, you will feel less hungry, period. Quote, BMI is highly heritable and genetic differences explain approximately 75% of BMI variability among oh. individuals. Whoa. Sorry, Other I'm yawning up the papers that storm, I read put it at 80%. My understanding of people who have lost weight and kept it off for a long time, because like those people do exist, mm-hmm. is that basically it's ongoing calorie restriction mm-hmm. and they're also exercising a lot more. Their body never kind of gets to the the lower set point mm. and the amounts of weight that people are able to keep off over the long term are relatively small. It's like people that have lost like 10 to 20 percent of their body weight. Yeah. The data on this is really bad because the only the only source of data on this is this thing called the National Weight Loss Registry, which is like self-reported and like no one knows how true any of it is. Yeah, I will say in all of the research that you and I have done for this show, I, maybe you have seen something I have not. I have yet to see data that shows shows someone who was fat for their whole life becoming thin and staying thin that's interesting yes right so Uh, i will point you to this channel we will prove it here there are actually other people that have done it online um obese to beast is a case of somebody that's like that but we'll give another example here so like I have definitely heard about people who were like, oh, I gained 20 pounds or 30 pounds through my pregnancy and now I need to lose it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have heard stories and anecdotes and seen data about thin people restoring their thinness. I have not seen or heard stories right. of fat people. Beca- OK, well, there are plenty of them out there and you just don't want to look at them. So one of my best friends, you've seen him on this channel. He is one of them. He was fat forever. He has pictures of him as a fat kid. He's not fat at all anymore. Not fat at all. So 
there are stories out there you just don't want to see them coming thin and staying that way that's a really good point i've 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 heard this from doctors that when somebody comes in who has lost more than 10 percent of their weight the doctors will be like oh you Mm -hmm. were only at that higher weight for like three months right yeah so i've lost more than 10 percent of my highest weight um i was i've that was the highest i've ever been and tip the the other sort of set point was probably around 370 so that was my kind of set point in like 2018 at the height of my um BED relapse it was about 370 and that was my starting weight for a long time <clears throat> So either way, whether you're looking at it from 370, fat pounds, I've lost 45 pounds of fat, which is higher than 10%. Um, And that's been happening for two years. So it's very slow. It's been very, very slow, but it did happen. So technically I'm in this category of what they're talking about. And I was 370 for, like I said, quite a bit of time. Another set point of mine was about 350. I was 350 pounds for many years from the end of high school all the way until I went down a bit in 2014. So like, um, few years after high school, then it went kind of back up over time. I've been kind of all over the place in terms of that. But yeah, I mean, no, he's wrong. Yeah, It's yeah, yeah. usually these like brief periods. But yeah, that's that's a really interesting distinction. I also have not heard of like someone who's just been fat their whole life, taking it off and keeping it off. Although I'm sure those people exist because it's a big country sure. and... Something I'm, about yeah, I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. Yeah. I'm just going to say like it doesn't yeah. show up very often in the research because so much yeah. of the research is geared toward like how do we find effective methods of weight loss? Yeah. Which, which is, is all, all temporary, temporary. Yeah. and yeah. all of which is built around. That's true. The expectations of thin people and thin bodies, right? Right. I don't right. offer any. That's also true. Any of this up to like drive us toward like better weight loss solutions or any of that kind of stuff. Of course you don't. Good God. But just to illustrate how deeply wrong, whereas I do, so that's where I am very different from these people. Headed our assumptions about weight and weight loss are, and fatness and fat people are. Right. It's incredibly clear in this research that like calories in, calories out is not a thing. Right. It shows up kind of everywhere, and we've just sort of accepted it pretty uncritically. And uh, researchers are not accepting it uncritically. It's also very interesting that these findings bounce around kind of technical fields or like more STEMI fields. Mm-hmm. We're just like, oh yeah, it's it's really difficult for anybody to lose weight and like a lot of it's inherited. And then when you look at the sort of the sociological conversation, the popular conversation and the political conversation, it's like none of that stuff has jumped over. No. The conversation about it is like, well, like we're going we're doing a municipal project to help everybody lose weight. Mm-hmm. It doesn't Well, we do talk about that on this channel and I will continue to talk about it with Lisa. And remember guys, I'm doing a podcast with her starting in August and we're going to do deep dives on all these topics together. So we're going to change that like, cause they're right about this. We do need to talk about this in regards to this issue and there isn't enough. Engage with this literature at all. Not only does it not engage with the literature, it engages with literature that has been actively disproven right. and debunked, <laughs> right. right? Like it's like actively like, nah, let's pull out the bad stuff that doesn't work and that yeah. makes people feel bad and that everyone right. hates and that we've right. all tried a bajillion times. <laughs> like, no, 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 yeah. no, let's do that. Okay. So I'm going to move us on to the next thing. That was assumption number one. We got okay. moves to make here. So tripartite structure. The next assumption that I wanted to look at is the idea that the calorie counts that we see on food labels or restaurant menus or whatever are an accurate and useful sort of set of information in understanding 
how our bodies use those calories. I am so interested in this. I am so excited to tell you about it. There's no way those Chipotle calorie things are accurate. There's no fucking <laughs> way. Okay, so it looks like they're starting to shift over into that other topic. That I don't personally want to get into. As you guys can tell, I'm really having a bad migraine. But I think it's interesting to show that sort of total reality denial and black and white thinking that goes into this type of mindset. Now, this happens on both sides of the equation, which is why I think it's really important that we change the conversations around these issues. I think it is really important that we shift diet culture, that we shift how conversations about fatness are had because yes, you know, oftentimes as a fat person, you're between these two extremes of it's only calories or calories don't exist. And it's extremely frustrating. And I think a lot of it, it just keeps us locked in this type of thing. And I want that to stop, which is why I'm here. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you guys again very soon. I hope you enjoy your day, night, whatever, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye, y'all.